Okay. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. I want to start by saying Happy New Year. Uh, today is Saturday, January 8th, and we are starting the first session of six um, with the two-volume um, epic, really, I consider it, uh, by Joseph Barada, The Politics of World Federation. Uh, for those of you who are with us for the last book, One World Democracy, you've already um, gotten acquainted with Joseph's writings because one of his articles was in the appendix of the last book. So this is the kind of perfect transition going into his books directly. Um, Joseph is considered by many uh, to be the leading historian of the movement. Um, he has his PhD in international diplomatic history uh, and actually his dissertation was on World Federation. It was essentially on the origins of the World Federalist Movement from 1937 to 1947. So he's been at it a long time. Um, he's been a professor teaching world history, English history, international relations, and the history of science and technology. And in addition to the um, two volumes that we'll be going over, he's also written the United States, uh, I'm sorry, the United Nations System meeting the world constitutional crisis and strengthening the United Nations, a bibliography on UN reform and world federalism. He's written numerous monographs, articles, book chapters, newspaper op-eds, presented, presented at conferences, written reviews and encyclopedia articles on the subjects we'll be talking about. I've heard Joseph speak a handful of times every time I've come uh, from that with a much richer appreciation for our movement and the work we do. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Joseph. Thank you, and I'm thrilled that you can be here. Well, thank you very much, Bob. That's uh, very kind of you, and uh, I think it's a little bit uh, overdrawn, really. I'm, I'm just a humble working man. Uh, now, um, I would like to speak only for about 20 minutes. I have uh, three topics. One is motivation, uh, second is um, strategy, and the third is the future. I'm only going to speak on uh, points one and two. Uh, why did I write this book? And uh, where were th what were the objectives and methods of United World Federalists? Uh, as for the future, where do we go from here? I'm going to uh, uh, keep that um, to myself uh, because I would like you all to um, see if you can draw your own lessons from the history. I have views, but it's better to make this an interactive uh, meeting. So first motivation. I grew up in the West and the South. I came East to get an education at St. John's College and later at Boston University. I served a tour of duty in the United States Marine Corps, and this changed my life. Um, I became completely disillusioned while in Taiwan uh, on an exercises to prepare for a war with Red China. Uh, and ever since I have been um, committed to uh, ending uh, not just the Vietnam War, but all war. I discovered the uh, absence of world government as the cause of wars while reading the preliminary draft of a world constitution of the Chicago committee. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I determined to write the history of this, um, of this world federalist movement since it promised to end war. Uh, when I started, I assumed that the idea of establishing a government of the world uh, was so relevant and so profound that uh, there must be departments in the leading universities uh, devoted to it and uh, great professors who uh, debated the uh, nationalists and the imperialists. But no, there was just nothing. Uh, so I uh, made it my business that to establish a new field of world federalist studies I should carefully uh, prepare the uh, bibliographies uh, on the, this, uh, what turned out to be a very large literature on this subject. I, um, 
Um, I also have um, made a personal collection of uh, most of the actual historical works, which I have behind me in my library. And I've established an archive of the world movement uh, in um, Amsterdam. Um, I encountered rather strange attitudes toward uh, the idea of world government. Um, some people say world federalists, are they still around? And others uh, get peculiarly angry at this idea. It's strange. Um, it seemed to me to be so, so good and so interesting, uh, but uh, no, people would rather not hear about it. So I've become rather cautious. Um, some people uh, say, it sounds like a good idea as long as we can control it. And they don't understand this, uh, what, what we're really talking about. I did uh, write a PhD dissertation on the origins of the World Federalist Movement. I became um, the UN representative of the World Association for World Federation in 1985, served three years in New York. <clears throat> I must say, uh, even though I knew that the United Nations was not a world government, uh, I was very impressed, by, first of all, by the flags going up First Avenue of all the nations of the world. Uh, and you know, the flags are displayed in alphabetical order, so that meant that the USSR and the United States of America were pretty close together. Um, and I also became very uh, impressed by the thousands of people who quietly uh, work at the United Nations. Um, they are trying to make a reality, even of what is only a step to world federal government. But um, then the WAF, the WAWF, the World Federalist Movement, simply collapsed. Uh, the money ran out. I had to raise my own salary and the Amsterdam office was closed. The director, Ron Ruthergren, uh, uh, resigned. And I found myself alone uh, in New York in that office. Um, and finally, I uh, actually uh, exhausted my own funds and uh, had to resign. And I went back to Cambridge saying, how could I have been so wrong? I determined then to finish uh, the writing of this book. I, um, it was to be a history, not another theory, book of theory um, or of philosophy, except that history as Bolingbroke said, uh, is philosophy teaching by examples. Um, it was not to be just uh, uh, anti-war, but offered a positive vision. Uh, I remember once uh, in uh, street demonstrations against the Vietnam War, uh, someone asked me, what's your alternative? And I didn't have an answer for him. So I made it my business to um, try to provide a positive vision uh, in, my, in my opposition to war. And vision was one of the things sorely lacking at the end of the Cold War. You remember how um, President H.W. Uh, Bush used to speak about the vision thing. Um, this was something that I wanted to provide. I thought I had the power, the intellectual power to do that. Um, my only power was to tell the truth. Uh, I had no position in government and, um, and uh, but I could tell the truth and I made that. Uh, that was my uh, standard. Uh, Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, once said that truth passes through three stages. First, it is uh, ridiculed. And second, it is violently opposed. And finally, it is accepted as self-evident. Uh, we're still at the ridicule stage. Um, I also wish to end the confusion in many of the survivors' minds about just 
what happened in the World Federalist Movement. Um, it uh, was not only Russia that was opposed, the United States was opposed also. And um, sometimes there are claims about World Federalists which are greatly exaggerated and make us look ridiculous. Um, for instance, um, Peter Ustinov and uh, Walter Cronkite uh, are uh, sometimes prominently mentioned, but there's, their commitment to this ideal was very uh, brief and uh, superficial. Um, I assume that despite the failures of the movement, it offered profound guidance uh, for the eventual establishment of a world federation and the rule of world law. I saw this project as the next great political revolution after the founding of the United States of America. I was guided by the Federalist Papers of uh, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. My standard for success was influence, <clears throat> like that of the Founding Fathers. I also wanted to meet the opposition. Um, because of my military experience, I was not interested in utopian projects uh, or pacifism or mere street demonstrations. I wanted to end the neglect of ideas of World Federation by historians, politicians, and political scientists. The movement left behind a very large literature, I repeat. I worked uh, 20 more years on the book. One of the reasons for the delay was that I realized that the problems were theological. World Federation is based on universal values like democracy and human rights, which have yet to be deeply embraced by all humanity. Uh, Albert Einstein once said, the real problem is in the hearts of men. Um, I knew that the Cold War was the main cause for the defeat of the Federalist movement, but I did not want to enter the contentious de debate concerning American foreign policy. Uh, my book alludes to the main facts and controversies, um, but it does not get distracted from the positive story of the World Federalists, whose very example was a challenge to traditional uh, accounts of the war. The best uh, history I've ever read of the Cold War is by D.F. Fleming, The Cold War and Its Origins, 1917 to uh, 1960. Okay, now a few more words about strategy. <clears throat> The aim of the World Federalists was to change the laws and the Constitution of the United States, and in principle, the laws of other countries uh, participating. United World Federalists, Inc., the mainstream American organization, was a public lobby designed to influence legislation. It was a public corporation, hence the Inc., it was not merely a tax exempt educational association like the World Federalist Association after 1975. The methods were similar to those of the civil rights movement, women's liberation, or the labor movement. Chapters were organized nationwide. Dues, $3 in those days were collected and people prepared to enter state legislatures and the United States Congress to lead debate. Historical conditions were favorable. The democracies, <clears throat> liberal and socialist, were united in a grand alliance. The atomic bomb threatened a third world war. The new United Nations organization created in a pre-atomic age seemed inadequate to keep the peace. There was a period of flux in foreign policy, as Ambassador William Bullitt said. After the first use of atomic bombs in war, popular radio announcer Raymond Grand Swing set a goal of 50 million adherents to United World Federalists in order to 
influence states to undertake the work of establishing the necessary government of the world to keep the peace. If 50 million people had been ready for world federal government in 1947, the movement would be remembered as truly phenomenal, even though most of the principles then in circulation were only hortatory, like those of Albert Einstein. As things happened, membership rose only to 47,000 by 1949. There were prominent leaders among the World Federalists, notably Grenville Clark, their elder statesman, and T.K. Finletter, legal brains behind UWF. Also Cord Meyer and Alan Cranston, later a senator from California. Roosevelt died at 63. If he had lived, he might have been able to moderate Western hostility to Stalin's treatment of Poland in Russia's security interest. Truman and Stalin acted in traditional sovereign ways and never lost control of events. Nevertheless, the Cold War did not become a fixture in international reality until the Korean War by 1950. It took time to undo wartime friendliness among the allies. Membership in the world movement, then called the World Movement for World Federal Government, rose to 151,000 by 1950, still far short of the 50 million. There were national membership organizations in 22 nations, counting associated uh, organizations like the Chicago Committee and leading individuals, there were a total of 72 popular World Federalist organizations in the historic period. One fact that bears remembering is that the world movement was not itself a federal union, but a league of sovereign organizations, as Emery Rees pointed out. The groups that aimed to unite the world could not even unite themselves. But we, we should remember that no social or political movement, not women's, not women's suffrage, nor the abolition of slavery, or even the American Revolution has been united. Victory comes in an enormous upheaval. The situation in Congress was in flux. 113 representatives supported the well-known World Federalist Resolutions, HCR 64, and 22 senators, SCR 56 in 1949, in the last ditch effort to hold off the Cold War. What actually passed was the Vandenberg Resolution, authorization for NATO. Even this was revolutionary, according to American historians, for it meant the abandonment of US isolationism and the acceptance of a permanent entangling alliance with Europe. Because of the division of the world into Cold War blocks, the world, fe world Federalists declined. They are remembered today rather like other idealistic movements that quickly faded in national history, such as Henry George's single tax in 1873 nine or Francis Townsend's plan to end the depression in 1933. The presidential campaign of Henry Wallace in 1948 is instructive for world federalists. It offers a look at what a serious political fight for world government might be. So does the failure of the People's Convention in late 1950. There were no attempts to found an international world federalist political party. As things happened, the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Veterans for Foreign Wars finished off the movement. UWF leadership adopted a top-down decision in January 1951 to liquidate the field operation under Vernon Nash. McCarthyism came later. Okay. Well, that's my still somewhat lengthy um, 
account of the strategy of the historic World Federalist Movement. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just turn it over to you. Please feel free to ask any question. Uh, Bob Flax is going to um, um, uh, uh, coordinate. And um, I hope everybody has a chance to ask uh, anything you please. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, your reactions. Great. Thank, thank you, Joseph, for that very rich accounting of history. I, I want to let, there was one person who arrived while you were speaking, and I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves like the rest of us did. Um, so Stephen, what we, we all did is we just said our name, where we're from, and one optional sentence, if you have anything to add to that. So if you want to, uh, now, now is your time, and you would need to go off mute. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I'm uh, Stéphane Bourget. I'm uh, living in uh, actually near Montreal in Quebec in Canada. Um, and I'm teaching physics in, in college. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been interested in uh, world citizenship for a long time. And uh, hopefully I'll learn more about it and see, you know, uh, additional ways that I can try to move uh, the, the movement and the idea forward. So thank you, everybody. Great, and thank you for joining us. So at this time, if you uh, would like to ask a question or make a comment, please, if you can raise your cyber hand, if you know how to do that. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll take the physical hands. I saw Gail and David. Um, let me just write their names down. And anyone else want to get in the queue? OK, I see the other David. OK, uh, Terry. Okay, and uh, Bharat, let's hold it there and I'll take another cue as soon as we've gotten through everyone. So first, uh, Gail, go ahead. Um, on page nine, you wrote, nevertheless, it is true that most federations tend over time toward unitary states. So every constitutional safeguard and eternal vigilance will remain necessary to preserve liberty. Um, you'd said before then that the unitary um, version was um, uh, totalitarian. So I was rather alarmed by that statement. And I'm wondering what cases you can you know, give or examples of federations that, um, that merged toward unitary states over time and what caused, those, what caused that to happen. Well, the, the first example is the United States itself. Uh, the original uh, federal union was extremely weak um, and it was resisted, particularly in uh, the South, uh, where, uh, uh, where slavery was protected in law. Um, but uh, gradually uh, the powers of the, uh, Federal government and especially the president have increased. It it, uh, it certainly began with Wilson and then uh, Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, and today why uh, the power of the president is uh, um, very very much greater than ever envisaged by the founding fathers. Um, the um, The example of the USSR would be even greater, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, it, this, the secretary of the Communist Party was virtually a dictator. Um, I used to be impressed by the fact that the USSR was a federation, so was Czechoslovakia uh, and Yugoslavia, but. Um, Every <clears throat> these countries had um, gradually come under the powers of the of the uh, Communist Party and the Secretary of the Communist Party, and so the at some points in I in my remarks I, I spoke of economic democracy um, or socialist democracy. Um, this is a kind of a generous statement. Uh, those countries were highly centralized. Uh, so the danger was that, that, that the world federal government would also become in time highly centralized. In fact, amongst the um, 
draft constitutions that uh, that are still worth studying. The, the constitution of the Chicago committee practically abolished the nation states. Uh, and uh, it was technically a federation, but uh, of regions, there were, uh, there were, I believe, um, nine regions that <clears throat> uh, from which uh, representatives would be elected. Um, but the, uh, the, th the threat really, and it uh, continues that even uh, our, our uh, vaunted federation of the world would probably undergo similar um, uh, centralization. Uh, so one of the great uh, difficulties, in fact, would be to devise some kind of government of the world, um, which would, <clears throat> Um, uh, which would be safeguarded against uh, incipient tyranny. And usually uh, Americans speak of the, the techniques used by the founding fathers here, particularly the division of powers, uh, legislative, executive, and judicial, and checks and balances, as uh, Hamilton put it, to um, let ambition be countered by ambition. Uh, and in this way, we could actually um, limit the powers of the government. Um, other countries like Britain doesn't have a system of division of powers and checks and balances. And so uh, uh, we will probably, we would see if ever the world um, it gets ready um, we will see some very ingenious devices. I look forward to them uh, for the world in all its diversity to prevent uh, concentrations of power. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it, it, it does. It, it's very concerning though, when you say that that tends to happen. So we need to examine those cases and then make, you know, develop extra safeguards because apparently that happened despite the checks and balances. True. Right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so if I may, move, then moving on to David Orton, followed by David Gallup. Um, professor, your two volumes were published in 2004. We now live in a post-Trump, post-Brexit world and many threats to democracy around the world. I was wondering how you are thinking now about how uh, the history of World Federation will be continued to be written. Uh, well, I, uh, that's a good question. I wish there were more writers of the history. Um, there are six that I, um, um, that actually have uh, attempted this subject. Um, Paul Boyer, Wesley Woolley, me, Lawrence Whitner, Mark Mazower, and Richard Maine. Uh, it's a pity there aren't more people who uh, take this up because um, the, the issues are so deep and they're so relevant uh, really to the present, even in the um, a world threatened by Donald Trump. Um, but most federalists, um, most, uh, pardon me, uh, most historians, I uh, just regard this as, a, well, my own dissertation advisor said, don't bother with the world federalists. They didn't amount to a hill of beans. You know, this it's a little long ago idealistic movement. And uh, I take the principles very seriously, but most historians uh, just don't. Why bother uh, working on a, on, a, on, a, on matters that are so remote from daily life that uh, it's, a, it's a damaged, it would be damaging to your career. Uh, the, um, the leader of the world governance movement, um, um, what's his name? Uh, Thomas G. Weiss. You should read these books by Thomas Weiss uh, about the United Nations and uh, 
world global governance. He's careful to distinguish global governance from global government. And uh, he once had it, he, when he was president of the um, International Studies Association in 2009, he made a great big, he made a, a great address called, uh, I think it was called, um, What Happened to the Idea of World Government? And in this address, he, he heaps abuse on me and he, uh, he uses my book as his uh, source for the World Federalists, but he's, he spells my name wrong and he's, he um, further um, states that no, no reputable professor would urge a student to undertake a dissertation on the world, on the, this crazy, uh, unrealistic World Federalist movement. So there's op there's opposition to it. I, I used to think that um, all I had to do was tell the truth, and, <laughs> and this, these ideas would uh, recommend themselves to uh, a large a large uh, population and a large group of scholars. Um, and uh, as uh, They just don't, it's, um, don't do it. It'll ruin your career. You'll end up like me, you know, in some remote location and you know, working for a state university. Yeah. Never get to Harvard with this. Speaking of Harvard, there used to be, Harvard used to harbor a lot of profound um, people like, uh, particularly like um, Arthur N. Holcomb. I've recently read his book, Toward a More Perfect Union. She, this is just a gem, uh, but those days are gone. Harvard is trying to uh, uh, to uh, be no more than about two years ahead of U.S. policy, and so to, to go back to uh, World Federation uh, is just foolish. Sorry, David. Well, uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, we'll go to the other David, followed by Terry. Thanks, uh, Professor Barada. Um, what you were just mentioning was the ridicule that you have even faced yourself as a professor in writing and the history of World Federation. And, and to return to the Arthur Schopenhauer uh, quote of truth passing through three stages and the first stage being ridicule, which you said is that that's where we're at now. I'm wondering what you think about the idea that actually we might be in already in the second stage, the violent opposition stage to world federation and, and world citizenship. The, the fact that there's all this structural violence built into the nation state system, that there's all continued preparation for war and ongoing wars that really are um, in the face of uh, this idea of a peaceful world, you know, a governed world with world law that, that we're already in this violent opposition stage. So how do, you, how do you respond to whether you think that we've reached that stage? I think we do. Um, and how do we get to the third stage of seeing the, uh, a world, a governed world through World Federation and World Citizenship as self-evident? Um, well, David, uh, I don't think we have reached the violent opposition yet the stage of violent opposition to our ideals. We're still at the ridicule stage, the naive stage, the unrealistic stage. Um, the wars that you see all around us, and uh, there's one threatened now in, in Ukraine, um, are wars within the sovereign state system, which, which is breaking down. Um, There is a danger, and uh, this, I must say, um, is something you all ought to consider. Um, there is a danger that we will reach the violent opposition stage, and that uh, we ourselves would be targeted as unpatriotic um, and as a dangerous to world peace. Um, <clears throat> um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, well, I think we're living at a terribly dangerous time now. I, I fear 
for the future. I have a neighbor down the street who's Russian and uh, she's uh, married an American and they live down the street. And uh, I, I, uh, I've recently uh, I've recently written a uh, article which is published in uh, Responsible Statecraft, by the way, uh, how we can avoid a new Cold War with Russia. And I shared this article with her before I uh, submitted it for publication. And she wrote back that she's a Christian and she knows from the Bible, later I figured this is from the book of John, uh, the apocalypse of John, she knows from the Bible that uh, there will be a war to solve these problems and um, and um, probably uh, America and will will launch this war against Russia. And I was so sad to see hear hear this from a, a Russian who's come here to find safety and I, I suppose. And I told her that um, uh, I've come to the same conclusion, but by a different route. I've come from a come at, I've come to this conclusion of by uh, a study of history. I fear, and this goes back to the um, Gail's question. Um, I, I fear that our the United States is on the verge of civil war. And, uh, and uh, it, what could happen is that the government would be will be seen as so paralyzed and in, in, in such continuous gridlock that the people will uh, support uh, drastic solutions, and uh, Donald Trump actually offers them one: uh, get rid of that democracy, folks, and uh, make me your your imperial uh, uh, leader, just like Napoleon, uh, uh, breaking out of the French Revolution. And um, and that fool, foolish man would could very well get us involved in a war to the finish, uh, what Arnold Toynbee called a knockout blow, uh, a war to the finish with Russia. And we will pursue an imperial course to unite the world. I'm sorry to say if uh, history very seldom proceeds by rational uh, uh, agreements like that of the founding fathers of the United States, it usually, it usually takes a, a violent act and a seizure of power. Imperialism is the way that the larger and larger political units have been formed over time. It's just like Alexander the Great and, and the Roman Empire emperors. This is, it's this danger that is before us. And I, my, my writing, folks, it may be foolish, but my writing was designed to, <clears throat> to reach a few thoughtful people in the interval where we can still take thought and, 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 and act. Once the, once the American war for world domination starts, forget it. I mean, um, just hunker, you know, just get down low and, and try to escape the, the Holocaust coming over your head. I, I tell you, I, I happen to know, I live near 40 miles from Boston, and I'm looking out my window to the east, and I am so afraid of, of a nuclear weapon landing in Boston that it'll come right over my hill, <laughs> over here in Worcester. <laughs> um, forgive me, I, uh, but um, uh, David, Hang on, baby. Well, th thank you, Joseph. This is all very sobering. Um, let me move on to Terry and then Barat. And I, yes. I, 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 just, I do see uh, Melanie and Ron Glossop already lining up for the next queue. I'll put myself in that as well and Evan. OK, 
Okay, please use your cyber hand, which is easier for me to spot because it stays up. Okay, so go ahead, Terry. Yes, I um, I, I was interested in uh, the the uh, introduction that you uh, that David Otten distributed, um, and wondering about your uh, principle of unity um, as a requirement for uh, the flowering of a, of a world federation. Um, currently, it's a scent that is the standard in the, in the uh, Security Council of the UN. All it takes is an abstention of, uh, of a dissenter to pass a resolution in the Security Council. Um, so what I think is more realistic is to seek assent around some global issues of, of, of interest to, to uh, ordinary people. And, um, and so my second uh, question for you is your uh, a focus on the prevention of war as a as a purpose for World Federation and uh, suggests that things like food security, shelter security, freedom from corruption, uh, which means economic security, um, uh, things like that might provide more positive uh, purposes for people to assent to a world government. Um, all right, uh, you had two questions. Um, you were um, wondering if it's necessary to have unity or what uh, sometimes called a perfect um, political community uh, as the foundation of, of World Federation. Uh, could we, uh, and um, then the, that led to the the second suggestion that there, there are smaller issues at the say at the United Nations like economic security or or cooperation and on smaller more rel, more uh, intelligible issues than world unity um, maybe we could make progress um, for instance that this the doctrine of sustainable economic development sustainable development or um, slow progress in uh, actual delivery of human rights um, or um, uh, currently there's a proposal to create a uh, anti-corruption international court you know all th these are measures that could be actually accomplished within the united nations um, the security council um, by the way um, has to reach a two-thirds majority it's not just enough for the big five to be in agreement uh, it takes nine of 15 to pass a measure at the, at the Security Council, including the positive votes of the F big five. Um, and um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most, um, to me, one of the most hopeful uh, proposals is the proposal of the um, group uh, De De Democracy Beyond Borders to create a second chamber of the General Assembly um, a second chamber uh, representative of peoples, uh, whereas the first chamber would be remain representative of states, and uh, uh, even the um, and the proposal is that even give the uh, second chamber no powers whatsoever, except the powers to uh, to discuss, just as in the, in the present general assembly. But the fact that and you might, it's, I really don't think the big five are going to agree to that because they'll appreciate the revolutionary implications of creating a democratic uh, uh, house uh, within the United Nations. But uh, in your terms, uh, Terry, um, it's conceivable. It seems so innocent, you know. Um, well, uh, what you're basically asking is, is could not, 
you're, you're referring to the theory of functionalism. And this is the theory going back to World War II of Bernard Brody of that uh, a world federal government is much too big uh, 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 an objective. We should make steady progress in those areas where humanity is already cooperating, like the, like the mail, the Universal Postal Union. Um, 1874 and the, the uh, International Telecommunications Union, 1865. You know, 1865, when Lincoln was president, this is when this, the ITU was created and it was. It, because people, as the railroads d developed, they needed to, to um, have common standards for uh, telegraphic communications across borders. And so the ITU was founded that far back. And so Brody argued that these kinds of things um, are what we can do. They are the small, the small objectives, just as you were suggesting, that could could be um, already are are being addressed. There are eighteen specialized agencies in the United Nations system, uh, at last count, and uh, that they're all functional organizations. They don't promise to unite humanity and uh, abolish war. They just propose that well we've got to learn to work together on small things um, like uh, food and agriculture, like uh, health, the World Health Organization. The, these are the things that uh, humanity can already do uh, without challenging the sovereign state system. And that, that and, and in fact, when you, I can't help but think this is exactly what we should support. Um, the, there are other books I, I would recommend to this, this reading group. The latest one is by Augusto Lopez Claros called uh, Global Governance and Global Governance and the Emergence of um, Global Institutions in the 21st Century. This is a splendid book and it's written by a man who uh, understands the ultimate objective of world federal government. Federal Union, but uh, we can make progress on small economic and functional uh, met, uh, goals. Agreed? Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you addressed it. I appreciate that. I think um, uh, the, the big goals, war prevention, et cetera, are, are uh, the province of, of states and not people, um, shelter security, food security uh, are burning issues. And, and uh, especially the World Health Organization is in conflict with corrupt local or, or national leaders in the furtherance of their duties. And uh, that's where the UN should step in. Um, the WHO and uh, and the food uh, food yeah, people um, do what they can, but there needs to be uh, a, a stronger arm in the in the mix. So thank you for your response. Great, and um, th thank you. And let me go on to Barat. Okay. Well. Uh, it's kind of difficult to <laughs> articulate uh, uh, many things that come to mind. If I may, I'd like to uh, state my question, my uh, comments in three different areas. Uh, one uh, relates to my being a scientist and in particular, having knowledge of phase transitions, uh, we find that most systems usually behave in a very linear way. Uh, the gradual little bit of force makes a little change, but occasionally there come singularities when you have a phase transition, when all of a sudden the system is totally different. I mean, that's what we see in a tornado, for example, or a hurricane. 
And so the question I have is, uh, there are the world wars in some way have been like these phase transition moments. Uh, and my thinking is that we have things like pandemic, climate change, and many other issues that are so global and no nation or country has any kind of power over it. Uh, and so to that extent, couldn't there be a, some kind of a mechanism to utilize some of these uh, singularities in totality of human experience that we, uh, nature uh, hands us over to sort of inspire us to become wise and, and think in a ways where ridicule turns to kind of reality, you know. So that's that's a kind of a broad thing. The other issue is more related to geography. Uh, I I'm sorry I didn't read all of the introduction or certainly not the rest of your book, but it seems to me that other than you know mentions of uh, the issues like support from Nehru and Gandhi and so on. There hasn't been that much of a scholarship on ideas of this world government that may happen, may have happened historically in other countries. And I'm, I'm curious, are there for, is there possible to kind of develop a, a community of people working on these ideas from different parts of the world sort of created pilots, uh, so to speak, and bring together and develop a network. And, and so that's the other kind of future idea. And, and, the, and the third thing that really of concern to me is that with our technology and understanding of how to harness uh, the physical world and, and it, we seem to be becoming experts in micro creations. So while we have weapons of war that can have major destruction, we are beginning to have individualized weapons, you know, machine guns, anybody could carry. And, and we see these incidents like happen in Kenosha and other places where individuals are kind of in the name of freedom and, uh, you know, rights are engaging in uh, local warfare on an individual level. And it seems to me that that's a very dangerous direction to move towards. And similarly, cartels in Mexico and other places, you know, they're taking over. And so, so that's the other kind of movement uh, that's taking place. And so I, I just, wonder, is there a, some kind of a strategic mix which perhaps diverges, but does not uh, take away this uh, motivation of ending war as a basis it, in, a, in a way uh, kind of going along with what Terry was trying to ask. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Uh, uh, the problem of being a professor who no longer is, is that we, we keep talking, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Any comments? <laughs> um, well, uh, let me uh, try this. Uh, uh, I, <clears throat> uh, I'm a retired professor and Mostly what I do is read books. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, let's um, uh, let's uh, just in the reverse order. Uh, it's true that uh, the uh, progress, so to speak, of uh, arms has uh, gotten more, gotten more and more individualized, and um, now these drones. Um, 
target individuals and uh, they drop a they um, they drop a hellfire missile right on the house uh, they can put one of those missiles right through a window um, the new york times just had a series on the civilian casualties that have been caused by the development of uh, drones um, and satellite communications um, mostly since the obama years well as an old soldier let me tell you you're damn right this is very scary and um, 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 those things have to be part of of um, disarmament. I'm, uh, I must say, uh, you read the older uh, World War II statements like the Atlantic Charter, and the word disarmament is very prominent. Uh, in the Charter of the UN, uh, it's I think the word does appear, but uh, we've lost the we've lost understanding of the argument of disarmament. The argument was that as long as states are 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 um, fully armed, whether with atomic bombs or with uh, hellfire missiles, um, uh, the the rule of law simply cannot work. We cannot uh, deal with our problems on a rational basis. Uh, fear will uh, so take over that um, nothing will, be, will nothing can be accomplished, and that's correct. I, I cannot say why the argument of the necessity for disarmament in order to make the rule of law a reality just has been forgotten. Now, um, as for uh, the uh, geography uh, uh, about why couldn't there be scholarship from other countries on these problems. That's why I have published my bibliographies. If, um, if you ever, if you, uh, uh, I found works from 72 nations on the world government. You know, I, when I was at the UN, uh, I, I uh, snuck into the Dag Hammarskjöld Library and it's been a lot of time they're going through their card catalog. And I thought, well, I wonder if they'd have anything on world government at the United Nations. Do you know they had two long drawers? And I copied out every single reference to, to works from Mexico, from India, from Japan, from and um, um, every European country, of course, the United States and Canada and Britain. Uh, what I hope, Bharat, is that scholars might realize there's a gold mine here. There are thoughtful people in every country, not just in number one, you know, but in little countries like India, you know, and China. These little countries, these podunk countries that aren't equal to the United States, they are full of intelligent human beings. And how can, why can't we get them why can't we? Why can't we connect them? Dear me, I, I think we really. I've done. Look, I'm a, just a dreamer, right? I I just produced a bibliography. What could be duller than that? You know, you couldn't finish the introduction, and how do you think you could get through a bibliography? <laughs> well, so, may the Lord have mercy on us. <laughs> now, um, lastly, science, a system upset. Um, you know, one of my discoveries, because I read books, right, is the theory of emergence in biology. And uh, you probably know about this. Uh, sci it, uh, uh, feedback mechanisms, as in, uh, <clears throat> as in, um, uh, 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 are, are part of it. And um, it may be, uh, emergence is a new theory of evolution. It's about the appearance of new uh, characteristics of which, of which the parts uh, uh, are, uh, are, uh, are, uh, do not share. Um, and it could be, uh, you spoke of um, global 
uh, singularities. Uh, I don't like that word. I think it's misused. I mean, they think that the Big Bang began on a singularity of infinite pressure and infinite uh, uh, and and of um, infinite density. This is. But uh, what I think you're pointing to, as a physicist, remember that Einstein was a physicist. And by the way, if you want to read a good book to help get your mind straight, read uh, read. Well, it's, one of these books of Einstein's political thinking. I have. I just want to point out we have a, a little more than 15 minutes and we have five people in the queue okay. um, and one introduction. All right. Next, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we, we were joined by uh, Virginia Swain. I want to uh, allow her just to say hello. Uh, Virginia, to let you know, everybody just said their name, where they're from, and one optional sentence. So if you want to check in, now's the time. Hi, I'm Virginia Swain from Worcester, Massachusetts. I happen to be married to this brilliant man. Um, it's just amazing. I was told when I met him that uh, scholars and practitioners don't get along. Well, I'm a practitioner and he's a scholar and we get along great. Um, we learn so much from each other, and I think we, we share the uh, values of the United Nations. We both have worked there for a very long time, so I want to say thank you. He read the book. He read his book to me one summer, and I was very enlightened by the, the contents. Great. Thank you for joining us, Virginia. Um, so just to let folks know, we have Melanie, Ron, Evan, Cassandra, and myself in the queue. Uh, I'd like to try to get everyone in if possible. So if everyone could be as brief as possible. And uh, let me just check with you, Joseph, if, we, um, if we're not done with everyone, um, could you be available another few minutes? Can we run over? Or, or if not, I totally respect that, but just want to check. Oh, yes, of course. I, as long as uh, I'm not going to be the one that uh, holds you up. OK, terrific. So, um, so with that, Melanie, uh, take it away. That's great to hear we have a little extra time with you because this discussion is so rich. You are so frank and open with your feelings, your thoughts, how you interpreted things, the journey you've been through, it's incredible. So I'm, first of all, thank you for that. I'm very excited about seeing you uh, the other times we're together because I think this is so helpful for all of us to really take the time to think because, for example, yeah, as you were saying, it's very scary. And for me, I'm like, oh, we have, you know, maybe 10 years to turn this around if, unless we get hit by, you know, a nuclear thing or nuclear weapon or whatever. And, or, you know, you have, um, don't look up a meteor, which is possible. But of course that film is supposed to be about uh, the climate change and, and the ridiculous, I don't know if you, I don't want to give it away, but the ridiculous way we're running things right now and how we have given away our power to a few individuals and we have allowed people to have weapons which um, is crazy. And so um, my, my joy in how I take this in without being, ah, oh my gosh, is now I found a community um, that's very interesting. I like to, two things. One, it's a new economic, new financial system to regenerate the planet. And it is in beta form, so it's very exciting for people who are in the know and can handle it to give their opinion. And it's also decentralized. It's called Seeds. You can go to joinseeds.earth. Just a community doing amazing things and doing it now, right now. And through that, I was introduced to a writer um, who wrote the book, The Chalice and the Blade, Rianne Eisler. And we took her course. So I think you've heard of it, but what it is, is basically remembering, and I think this will be helpful for all of us, that 6,000 years ago and before, they're finding new information, the Minoan society, they're finding that there was, and what Rianne coined, something called, a society called partnerism. Um, so it's, so instead of having socialism, capitalism, fascism, all the isms, you have a new one called partnerism. And that is basically 
um, taking it to two types of systems. You have the domination system where you, you're dominating over a group, whether it's a gender, a race, the other, you're dominating, dominating. It takes a lot of resource, a lot of energy. You have to have the military, you have to have violence, and you, you have to keep people in fear, and that's the domination. Melanie, system. I hate to interrupt, but I'm going to ask you to be brief if possible. Okay, okay. So partnerism is the opposite, and I've just wanted to offer that to you as a way of taking in the past, the history of of what actually worked in the past, that we can incorporate that and learn from it. And I wondered if you'd heard about partnerism. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't quite remember uh, the chalice and the blade, uh, <clears throat> but I did read it and it was charming. Um, I, uh, I, Melanie, um, you you seem to uh, you think big, and you talk about a new financial system that might supersede the conflict between capitalism and socialism, or uh, something else that uh, is somehow mixed with feminism, chalice and the blade, Rian Iser. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, you know, I, I sometimes think that world government is is a an, a little a, a little thing, um, and uh, these things like changing the financial systems available to humanity, that's a really big big order. I think these things will evolve. I, I'm more power to them. Um, they don't need our help. They're doing fine. Just uh, let a hundred flowers bloom. Mm -hmm. okay, so let me have another question, please. Okay, moving on to Ron Glossop. Ron, you got to go off mute. Oh, you went off and back on. Okay, you're off mute. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you, Joseph, for all you've been doing for our movement. I do want to ask you a question. Uh, when we Americans think about the movement from confederation to federation, we of course focus on the United States. My thought is maybe we should be thinking more about Switzerland, which according to my knowledge, succeeded in moving from a confederation to a federation using the United States as kind of a model, but also having a disadvantage that the United States did not have of diverse languages. Well, the United States at least had the unified language of English that brought us together. That was not the case for Switzerland. So does Switzerland give us any ideas about things that might be helpful for the idea of a world federation? Well, Ron, I, I know that you, you have seen hope in Esperanto. Um, uh, Switzerland has uh, four official languages, as you know, uh, uh, French and German and Italian and- uh, Romance. Romance. Yeah. Romance, yeah. But the Swiss get along fine. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think this matter of language is, is, is very relevant. It's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to unite. Um, and I, I'm trying to learn Italian myself. And you know, um, when you get to be my age, it's, uh, it is really hard to learn a language. I, I have to just get out the dictionaries and the grammar books and uh, it's gotten so I can't even read and my eyes hurt and I, I can write Italian and I sometimes write to my colleagues at the University of Turin, um, but it's a job. Yeah. It wouldn't be any help. It wouldn't be helpful if I told them, well, we've all got to learn Esperanto. <laughs> no, that I'm, I, I, Esperanto is easy. <laughs> you know, Ron, you're a good man, but uh, the truth is, the uncomfortable truth is that 
the world languages that's evolving is English. It's the language of communications, and it's the language of commerce, it's the language of travel. Um, in Italy, every <clears throat> the students are taught in English, and it's because uh, it will be more useful to them in life than uh, they expect other people to learn Italian. I hate this. I hate this because it 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 affirms American prejudice. Uh, I think it's an ob obligation of any any uh, intelligent person of this age to start to uh, make an effort to learn French uh, or uh, Italian. Um, I lived in Israel for a year, and that's a good way to learn Hebrew. Uh, travel and learn the way to understand other peoples is to learn their language. Really. So let's have another question. Okay. Uh, we have Evan followed by Cassandra, and then I'll wrap it up. Evan, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess I'm a functionist or partnerist in, at heart, and I was very encouraged by the commentary in the introduction on the changing language by which people are looking at federation. Of course, I think there's a um, major um, transformation in thinking from a more legalistic to a functionalist way of looking at it. But I'm very disappointed in the scholarly world in general in not engaging in comparative studies of governmental systems that would uh, facilitate invention uh, across the barriers, across the iron curtains uh, that uh, exist. And I wonder if you have any commentary about that. Um, well, there, there is a, there's a discipline called uh, comparative politics, um, uh, not to be confused with international relations. Uh, and in uh, comparative politics, uh, the effort is to do just what you say. It's uh, to uh, <clears throat> to see what we can learn by comp by uh, studying the uh, comparable politics. Uh, for instance, um, the uh, more, more I was going to say um, compare. Britain and France and the United States. Um, the parliamentary system in Great Britain is actually uh, very different from the uh, American system of government. And then France, um, I, I don't, can't say off the top of my head, I can't quite uh, say what it, what it is. Um, but I think what you're asking for is is, is broader than than uh, the existing discipline of comparative politics. Uh, you're asking the question that someone that also came up, um, David uh, uh, David Auten mentioned too. What do you do when the, when the scholars just aren't interested in your subject? How do you how do you motivate them? Uh, how can you uh, get them to take up, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, social and political ideas that are not popular or not uh, well established? And federalism is a good example. Um, you, uh, you just, you have to use uh, charm. You have to sort of. Uh, you have to sort of uh, delight them with such uh, simplicity and naivete, like my work, that, um, damn, uh, maybe we should look into this. Let's have another question, please. OK. Maybe we could send our, our whole organization to charm school and uh, <laughs> see, see what happens. So um, OK, let me, before I turn to Cassandra, um, we were joined by uh, Janet, and I want to give her a chance to introduce herself. Uh, Janet, everybody just said their name, where they're from, and one optional sentence. So if you want to say anything like that to check in. 
Um, my name is Sister Janet Ackerman. I am a Racine Dominican of the same community of Carname, and she invited me to just come and um, as a point of interest, um, just to find out what your group is about. Thanks. Great. Thank you for joining us. And let me let me now turn back to Cassandra. Go right ahead. Hi. So my question is based on uh, a comment you made earlier. Uh, talking about putting your book together and the problem you had putting putting one of your books together was you found that it was so theological or that there was a theological barrier. And I just wanted to understand that better. Um, um, I... I um was moved to um, think about this in, as theology. Um, in reading the speech of General Douglas MacArthur on the deck of the battleship Missouri on uh, September 2nd, 1945, as he received the Japanese surrender, um, I can, it's quoted in my uh, conclusion, which is on, which, um, but MacArthur said that Uh, mankind has had its last chance at solving its problems through warfare. The problem is basically theological, he said. And we have to uh, assemble all of our wisdom, our art, our um, uh, uh, and um, uh, to uh, find a better way to uh, solve our international problems. And uh, it struck me that that's my problem. And that's what the problem of the World Federalist. It's what uh, Einstein meant when he said that our problem basically is in the hearts of men. It isn't in the design of our political institutions. It's in our hearts. We don't really accept the uh, diversity of peoples. Uh, uh, we, we don't believe in the equality of men, we there's, we give lip service to this. There is a declaration of human rights, but to really believe this, you have to believe that the Russian or the German or the or the uh, Ghanaian or the uh, Kenyan or the Indian or the or the Vietnamese or the Chinese, these people are really just exactly equal to us. You have to believe it so hard that you say they really are world citizens. They could be world citizens. We could, their vote could be as in equal to ours uh, in electing a world legislature. We, that we don't believe. We really, I mean, there are seven plus million billion people in the world. And uh, you read the daily news uh, on all the conflict on the front page of the, of the newspapers and you think, you know, out of this, we're going to make a world. We're going to unite humanity. It it's it is so deep a problem. I'm inclining to the view that World Federation is about 500 years distant. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm 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 at last in the queue, so I'll, I'll ask my question. Um, and, and mine is a strategy question, and, and we just happen to have three people on CGS's strategy committee uh, on, on the call here. So the um, question is such that, that we went through the, you know, what, what has been called the heyday of World Federation after World War II, then even though it's, it's receded greatly, um, still it looks like humanity has advanced, you know, for several decades to be more rules-based, uh, more humane. Many indicators show that the prevalence of war has gone down, even though they, we now have greater, you know, stronger weapons, et cetera, et cetera. But now we've entered another era um, of increasing authoritarianism, nationalism, Trumpism, all of that stuff. And, um, you know, and both Russia and China are, are doing a more, you know, kind of breaking away from, or at least what looks to me like breaking away from that rules governed world. Um, 
and and so it, it looks in in a, in a way that we, we are in a very precarious place especially given our movement and what we want to do you know but at the same time i've heard world leaders you know biden and others you know in looking at the climate change situation or well, crisis i should say as well as the pandemic that we're in um, for the first time I, i've seen world leaders talking about the failure of global governance you know, as as we now have it. And when people start questioning that, it looks to me like an opening, you know. So so my, my, my question is strategy. W what do you do? How do you navigate that kind of minefield of, you know, in certain respects, things getting worse, but at the same time, new openings to question things that haven't been questioned before? Um, and if I throw in one more element to there, uh, Naomi Klein's notion of the shock doctrine, um, that when something horrible happens, 9-11 is, you know, one of the chief examples, the, the ideas that have been, quote, laying around, you know, can come to the fore where there was no space for them before. So I'm thinking part of what we do, in addition to kind of the logic of moving forward, educating the public, lobbying, you know, the politicians and all, to also have things really formulated so that when the blank hits the fan, if it goes that way, um, rather than things taking a dramatic swing toward the authoritarian, that we do have this other alternative that, that could be considered. So, so that's kind of, you know, my own thinking. How do, we, how do we navigate that minefield, take advantage of the opportunities, while at the same time prepare um, you know, the good cogent arguments when, if things do hit the fan, to put them in front of the, of the people and say, hey, there's this other way. We don't have to, we don't have to elect or, or, or appoint a czar, you know? So uh, uh, that, that's my question. Thank you. I'm not sure I <clears throat> um, followed your, followed you. Um, mm -hmm. We are experiencing in world history uh, a swing back toward nationalism. It's true. Uh, you see it uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and you see it here in the United States. Um, and I think you were, uh, uh, I think uh, when you mentioned that there's been a failure of global governance when we deal with climate change, I think what you mean is there's been a failure, not of global governance. Well, it's really a failure of the state governments. It's a it's a feeling of the it's a failing of the national states. Um, they can't uh, summon the courage and the will to uh, solve these problems by rational agreement. Uh, you know, I was struck that the uh, recent. Uh, Conference of the Parties, COP26 at, 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 at Glasgow, Scotland. Why, um, why is it 26? Well, it's because it's, uh, they've been meeting for 20, 26 times since the, the Treaty on Climate Change and the Treaty on Global Biodiversity were uh, agreed to in 1992 at the Rio Conference. Yeah. And so what's failing is that the state system is not uh, is not uh, uh, cannot produce uh, tangible uh, changes in economic policy um, and global governance, uh, if it exists, uh, is uh, not helping. Um, uh, I'll just say one thing because I know time is short. As you probably know, uh, Germany has a new chancellor. His name is uh, Olaf uh, Schultz, uh, if, I, if I have that right. And um, next year in April, why France is going to choose or or a new or reelect uh, the old uh, uh, Monsieur Macron. Um, I expect some uh, initiative to come from the middle-sized powers like Germany and France. Um, Uh, Germany, for instance, has uh, organized a group called the uh, Alliance for Multilateralism. Uh, watch that. Um, 
the uh, recently last year uh, there was a UN conference on UN 75 and um, quite a splendid uh, series of proposals came out of this group. Um, but what we're waiting on is for one, just one national state. Uh, sometimes it's Ecuador that's mentioned because her ambassador is part of this, but um, one national state to propose uh, anything on that list of things that um, the people uh, so desperately asked for. It's a very fine uh, document you can get. You know, what's happening? Well, go to the Stimson Center and get their document on UN 75. Yeah, we were, we were involved with crafting the People's Declaration. Yeah. 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 So uh, I don't expect uh, leadership from the United States, but we might see it from the middle ranked powers, Canada, France, uh, Germany. We won't see it from Britain. Um, you could conceivably see it from Russia. Um, but um, anyway, um, watch the middle powers. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, since we're over at this point, I, I, I want to just check in and ask if anyone has any announcements or events or things, but please be brief. If you do, we're already over time. So any, any announcements of that nature? Going once, going twice. Yes, Gail. So our next session will be the second, the second Saturday of February. That's the, the, um, the format, the second Saturday of the month. And for February, that will be February 12. We'll be discussing chapters four and six. And Professor Barada sent us those chapters among also a number of others. So I'll be resending them. So you'll have them um, attached to the email I'll send. I've already sent, in fact. And then March 12, we'll be discussing chapters 8 and 16. April 9, chapter 17. May 14, chapters 20 and 22. And June 11, chapters 26 and Appendix F. So the second Saturday, same time, same place, Zoom um, from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. So you can mark your calendars. And I just wanted to ask Janet Ackerman, who's joined us, if she's on our e-list, because if you're not, I'll, um, it, you can send me your, your email address in the chat and I'll make sure you get on our e-list. If you're already on, great. Terrific. And, and, and before I say goodbye, I just want to let everyone know that in, in case it wasn't clear, we are not going to be going over the two volumes in their entirety. So if you do want them, you're welcome to purchase them. You can go online, purchase them through whatever way you generally get books. Um, we, we will be sending out the PDFs for those chapters that we will be doing, but you're certainly, or, or reviewing and discussing here, but you're certainly, yes, uh, David Gallup is holding up the, the, two, uh, the two volumes right now. So you're welcome to purchase them if you want them in their, in their entirety. And then you could do like I'm doing, of take your yellow highlighter out and make your comments in the margins and do, and do all that stuff. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Again, Happy New Year. Uh, Joseph, let me um, let you know that, that Gail and I usually stay on a few minutes to debrief. If you can join us, that would be terrific. If not, you don't have to. Um, but, but again, Joseph, thank you so, so much, not only for the work you've been doing, uh, the knowledge you've conveyed, uh, but also as, um, as we said, for your transparency uh, during, during this session. So, yeah. Okay, so at this time I invite everybody else to leave the Zoom room and uh, Gail and I um, and Joseph will hang out for another moment. Oh, and Bob, um, yeah. if you want to ask to, to us to meet after this. Oh, great. Uh, I'll call you. You call me. Okay, okay. great. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Professor Rada. Okay, I think Terry stepped away and left his thing on. So let me.
Uh, remove him. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Joseph. Um, how, how is this for you? Oh, it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, hope I... Um... Oh, I'm going to close the recording. I just noticed that it's still on. Let me shut that. Okay, stop.